Well, good morning. I'm not really sure why you would want to hear my story um, about my passion for education and then the connection of that passion to my Christian faith, but Dr. Spindle uh, invited me to share that with you. Um, so I will share with you my introduction and to a couple of colleagues at the end. Um, the way it all started was that education captured me more than I pursued education. I had not dreamed of being a teacher. I was not an education major when I came to college. I have no teachers in my family. I did go to school and I did well in school. And that was about the extent of my involvement in education. In fact, I left high school after my junior year and came on to college, this college, back then Bethany Nazarene College. I was a 17-year-old college freshman and the day after I turned 18, I began driving a school bus for Putnam City Schools. So that was my first introduction into a career in education. Fast forward, fall of my junior year, I backed off of taking courses in my major and I indulged in the courses in the English department that interested me. Jim Wilcox, Wanda Morgan, Carolyn Waterman, Dr. Jennings, offered courses in writing and literature that I loved. <clears throat> By December, I jumped ship with science and went with an English major. My advisor steered me towards English education instead of a straight English degree, and that is how my journey in education officially began. I started teaching at Mustang High School right after I graduated college, and three years later, I lost my mind a little bit and went to California for a few years to teach middle school. I went through two incredible rounds of the writing project, the Oklahoma Writing Project and the Kern Eastern Sierra Writing Project, and those experiences confirmed my fall into education as an educator, and I learned about myself that writing was my strength and that literature uh, was second to writing. Finally, I saw the light and I returned to Oklahoma. I left public ed and I did a graduate assistantship at Southern Nazarene University and then I began teaching here in the English department. I taught Comp 1 and Comp 2, I taught writing workshops, technical writing, and a little bit of Southern literature and culture over the course of 18 years. This period of time is when my decision and immersion into education as an educator was confirmed. I began to study the craft of teaching and the significance of education in people's lives and in uh, their community and their culture. As I finished my doctorate at OSU, go Pokes, my focus in education uh, and my study and practice changed to educational leadership. I was hired at OSU and I taught in the College of Education for four years and ran a program for school business officials. And then three people that you will know, Dr. Melanie Kaiser, Dr. Tim Taylor, Dr. Dennis Williams, reached out to me and affirmed me as I considered directing the Master of Arts in Educational Leadership here at SNU. I returned here in 2014 and I'm now nestled into my calling of graduate education here. My point in telling you this story is that I evolved into my mission and my calling. There was no burning bush experience for me. There was no audible voice of God. Some of you may have a very defined goal for your future. Go for it. If you're still thinking and searching, consider going with your strengths and your interests as you figure things out. As these different positions have opened up for me, I have been introspective and looked at the bigger picture of my core values and how I can use these values in my very meaningful work. It's a journey of reflection and contemplation as well as a journey of working with students, working with faculty, millions of emails and meetings. At the beginning of many days, I try to ask myself questions like, how do I lead through a certain situation? Or what does God want me to do here? Or how can I share his love and what that means to others? That's my professional journey. 
The way that my passion for education interacts with my Christian faith is part of it all. I have chosen to follow Jesus and to learn what it is to be in relationship with God. This is not something that I have learned in an instant. The salvation was instant, but the understanding has been the acceptance of his love for me, and it's been a process. It's been two steps forward and one step back. It's been rescue when I am hurt. It's been peace and joy when I am living in faith. And it is growing an understanding of what it means to be a child of God. And that is my very favorite title. I am Christian. It's the foundation of what I am. It's not a separate compartment. I am Christian before I am wife, before I am mother, before I am educator. I want everything I am and everything I do to be seen through that lens of Christianity first, which means I am unapologetically Christian. As a human being, it also means that I'm fallible and that I depend on this journey with Jesus to shape and teach me as I travel. In my world, the way that I connect my calling to my work is first by prayer. In the United States, there are laws that prevent public school educators of any religion from leading a prayer in front of students or at an event. However, prayer is in no way limited to time and space. I can pray over all of my students. I can pray for athletes in any event. I can pray for an individual student. I can pray about desperate situations or family problems that public school teachers and students are facing. I don't have to be in front of these people in these public settings for God to hear my prayers. It's not my nature to proselytize. As I have grown older and become more comfortable and confident in my role as child of God, I can refer to my calling from God. I can talk about my faith in Christ. I can speak of the support that my church family offers me. I can retell the blessings and the help of the Holy Spirit as I sort through different things I might face. I truly want everyone to have the beauty and security of a relationship with Jesus in their lives. This life, this journey, is not about the do's and don'ts of being a Christian. It's about the freedom and the blessing to live in the shadow of his wing. Finally, um, I think that it would be great for you to hear from a couple of people that are really important in my life. Uh, and they're part of the Graduate Studies and Education Leadership. Uh, faculty and staff. We have a great um, group just right out this hallway down the hall and I'd like for any of you to stop by for a visit anytime. I would love to win you over to education as a potential career. So do stop by. Um, first, I would like for you to hear from uh, Patty Milford. Patty Milford is our program advisor for the Masters in the Doc. And uh, she's going to answer the question of how I integrate my faith and how you see that in my work. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about what she talked about. If you come by our office at any time, Stephanie will greet you. And she will greet you like a friend. And she will greet you like you are expected. You are wanted and you are expected. Not as if, oh, you suddenly came in and we've got to work around your visit. She, ex she expected you and she's ready to greet you and she offers time with, uh, with her. And the other thing that I, no visit is ever a surprise. She just knew you would come to see her. And I love that about her, that she always knows that somebody's going to pop in on her. And when we approach, I think that this is how I see Jesus. When we approach him, we are not only welcome, but we are excitedly expected. Great. She was so nice. Thank you, Patty. Um, another colleague, Dr. Kent Schellenberger, he is faculty in the Master of Arts Education Leadership Program. And so, what do you have to say? I'm kind of Hello. nervous here. <laughs> Well, good morning and greetings from the MAEL and, and the DEL programs. Uh, we welcome you to this new academic year and we're thankful that you are a part of Southern Nazarene University. It's easy to see the Christ love in the classrooms that Dr. Case teaches. She uh, meets her students in a tangible way. She uh, meets them on a, on, a, on a daily basis when she is uh, 
dealing with the students. I've had the privilege of observing her when she did teach middle school, and I've also had the privilege of observing her as she's taught master's classes. She shows Christ's love in everything that she does. She meets students with Christ's love, and that's, that's the joy of working with a person like Dr. Case. So we're thankful to be a part of Southern Nazarene. We're thankful you're a part of, set of Southern Nazarene, and we welcome you anytime. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot that you had heard me, um, or that you had observed me teaching middle school, which is a calling all into itself. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you all um, about my connection with my Christian faith and my calling. Thank you. Good morning. Um, first, thank you to Dr. Case. I really enjoyed listening to your calling and how you integrated that into your career and, and, and how SDU has been such an important part of that. And I thank you for sharing this time with me as well. And great job, worship, um, worship team. I love, love this. So, you don't have to look very far and look around to see that superheroes have captivated the imagination of our country and even kind of our world. In the previous century... You learn about superheroes through these things called comic books. They're like actually pages, and you opened them up, and you looked at them, and now, they, now they're called graphic novels for some, some of you. They, I don't think they were called that back in my day, but that's what they're called now. But in this century, Marvel has rolled out blockbuster after blockbuster after blockbuster of superheroes. And I know even back in my time, we sat around and talked about, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you have? So right now, I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to talk about what superpower you would have. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you have? You have about 10 seconds. Talk to each other. Okay, you got one? Everyone needs to have one. Make sure you have one. What superpower would you have? Okay, let's come back together. I don't have much time. So... I want you to raise your hand if you said mind reading. If you want to read people's minds, raise your hand. Okay, these are the creepy ones in the room, right? I don't want to read anybody's mind. And, and, and you know what I mean by that. So secondly, if you want super strength, if you want to be the Hulk, if you want strength, raise your hand, raise it high, raise it high. There you, there you go. What about super speed? You'll be faster than anybody. Hopefully all the running backs in the room want this strength, right? Hopefully you raise your hand. What about telekinesis? For those in the back, telekinesis means you can control people's minds, you control things with your mind. And I'm joking. Raise your hand. Yeah, but that, that's the reason you're in the back, because you don't want your mind controlled, right? What about flight? Who wants to fly? You all are kind of crazy, too. Like, 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 seriously, think about that for a second. You really want to be up there with nothing around you flying. I mean, it, that, that kind of freaks me out, like the whole fear of heights thing, right? That, that's a little ner nerve-wracking, right? Well, what if I were to tell you that you already have the greatest superpower in our world today? Yeah, here it comes. Don't worry. It, it, it's going to be fine. This, this power is greater than anything we've already talked about. The problem is our society and many, and many times our culture has cheapened this power. We've allowed society to redefine this power. We've allowed society at times to even misuse this power. Anyone have a guess what it is yet? This power has literally changed people and has altered human existence. Did someone call it out? Say it loud. No. That's the good science school answer, though. Kind of, but not really. What's the power? Come on now. It's in 1 Corinthians 13. You've heard about it since you've been a little kid. Love, right? So now here it goes. I know, okay, you're going to roll your eyes in the back of your head. And you're like, oh, he's going to talk about love. Yes, I'm going to talk about love. Well, first of all, as I begin talking about love, it wouldn't be fitting if I didn't throw pictures of my kids up on here, right? Because that's, that's what you got to do when you're a dad and you speak in chapel. So I should have, there, here you go, these are my boys. Left picture, Caleb and Nathan. Caleb is a, a sophomore in high school. Nathan's a seventh grader. But for the story I want to tell you, this goes back to the picture on the right. First day of first grade, first day of fourth grade. One morning on the way to school, it's about a five-minute drive, um, I handed my phone back to Caleb and I said, hey, Caleb. Read us the verse of the day. Open the Bible app and read us the verse of the day as we're going to school. And so Caleb pulled out the phone and he read, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. 
It does not boast. It is not proud. And I said, ooh, ooh, this is good. Keep, keep reading. Keep reading. This is a good one. And he, so then he kept reading. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This little practice became, became kind of like a morning routine for us. On the way to school, after about a week of doing this, we didn't need the phone anymore. And I would just say, okay, boys, love is, and they would go back and forth. Patient, kind, does not envy, does not boast, persevered. They go all the way through all of it. And at the end, my little one Nathan would say, love never fails. And he would scream that out in the car. And I would say, okay, go to school and be loving today. Choose one of these today and do it at school. And, this, and then let, let's talk about tonight when you get home. And so in the evenings when they would get home, sometimes around the dinner table, sometimes even on the way home, we would talk about what does it mean, like, like what did you do today to be loving? How did you love somebody today? And the stories that came, I don't remember the stories early, early on, but the stories over these last two or three or four years have been quite amazing. One day, my, my, my youngest, I think he was in third grade, Nathan, he said, Dad, this morning when I was walking into school, my friend Sammy was carrying all her stuff, and she had like a project, like a poster board, and she dropped it. And her books and her papers and her pencils and her poster board, it went everywhere. And she just stood there, and she looked, and she was starting to cry. And I ran up to her, and I said, oh, Sammy, it's okay. And I picked everything up and helped her carry it to her classroom. Dad, I chose kindness today. I want to be kind. I said, great, that's amazing. Another day, my oldest, Caleb, came home and he said, Dad, today in class, in science, the teacher started asking a bunch of questions. I knew all the answers to the questions, but I didn't raise my hand because I didn't want to be boastful. So I, I chose love today. I didn't want to be boastful. Another day, my son Nathan came home. He goes, at recess, there's a bunch of boys cheating in gaga ball. They, they weren't getting out when, they were, when, the, when the ball was hitting them. And I was getting so mad, but I chose not to be easily angered. And so I left. I walked away and went, and, and went to meet other friends. Another day, my son Caleb said, Dad, today I was running really, really late. It was raining hard, and as I was going in the building, I looked over, and the bus had just dropped off a line of kids, and they were getting soaked. So I held the door open for them, and I said, hey, you're going to have a good day. You're, you're going to be fine as they were running in the building. I chose love today. I wanted to be kind. So in these little instances, choosing love changed people's days. And I think that is what, when it comes to a superpower, that's what we want, right? We want our superpower to be able to impact ourselves and others. So in the same way, these stories have gone on and on. Maybe now when we go to school, we don't always quote the love, the love chapter. We, we read other things from the Bible. But every once in a while, I'll say, boys, love is, and they'll go back and forth. Patient, kind, does not envy, does not boast. Well, so, so this practice has really ingrained in me the importance of love. And, and, and I, I love talking to, the story, talking to my boys about the stories of how they can change other people's lives through love. So as the program director of the Master Leadership Program, when I was envisioning what this program would look like, I wanted it to be different than all the other Master's programs that are out there. And one of the ways that I thought that could be distinctive to SNU and could be a different way for our program to run is to weave these tenets of love through the program. So through the program, through different courses, we talk about this. In fact, in the very first course, which by the way, now I'm going to pause, if you're interested in a graduate program, if you're graduating in December... We have a cohort starting in February. Stephanie's cohorts are great as well. But if, if, if you want to be an educator, you just want to be a, a different type of leader in, in, in the world, come, come look at my program. We have a cohort starting in February. Cohort starts in August. So, yeah, I would love to have you talk to me afterwards. I would love to give you more information. Okay, now let's get, let's get it back on track. Okay, so I wove love through. In the, first, the very first course, in one of the devotions, I, I listed out what we just read. And I listed out all the ways that love can be, can be done, the, 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 the action ways that, that love can, can happen. And I, I encouraged the students to change the word from love to leadership. So leadership is patient. Leaders are kind. Leaders aren't boastful. Right? And then I encourage them to take their name and put it in that place. So Michael isn't easily angered. Michael always protects. Michael always trusts. In these ways, you take this notion of love and you make it personal to you. And you make it a way that you can impact those around you. That you can truly change the world through your superpower. So now, now I, I've said change because sometimes these practices take a change. We're going to have to do this differently. Well, we have another course in our master's program that focuses on change. And, there are, and, and one of the things that we teach is there are four easy steps to do change. 
So for some of you, I say change and you freak out, right? And, and, and that, that's natural. Some people don't, don't like to change. But here are four steps for you to change the way that you might be living daily and institute a practice of love into your daily routine. Step one, start small. Try doing one love practice today. Just do one. There's 16 of them. Pick one today. As you walk out of here, think, I'm, I'm going to be kind today. Open the door for somebody. Say, say, say a nice word to somebody. Start small. And then let it grow from there. Step two, make one change at a time. Too often I think we fail when we try to make changes because we want to change a bunch of things at one time. We'll just change one thing at one time. So start small. Choose a practice. Maybe institute that practice for the whole week. So rather than doing one today and another one tomorrow, that, that, that's too many. Just, just do one at a time. Be patient this whole week. Try to protect somebody this whole week. Don't be easily angered this whole week. Step three, enjoy the journey. You might, be, you might ask, what is that? Reflect on how this process makes you feel. And through that reflection, you'll be able to see what's happening, and that'll help you find joy. And when you find that joy, tell someone about it. Share it with somebody. Say, man, I've, been, I've worked on my patience this week, and it's actually really working. It's really helping. Do that. Enjoy the journey. And, and step four, be grateful. So through this whole process, find gratitude. Find ways that your life has been changed and find ways that you have helped other lives be changed for the better and be grateful for that. Again, find a mentor, share that with them. Find an accountability partner, share that with them. Share this journey of how using your superpower in the ways listed in 1 Corinthians 13 makes you a better person but also makes those around you better. So, as I conclude, how will you use your superpower? Which one are you going to choose? What practice of love are you going to implement today? You have, you have the rest of the day ahead of you. Think about it. If you have the Bible app on your phone, open it up, highlight it. Write it down somewhere. Put it on the mirror in front of you. I'm going to be this way today. I'm going to love this way today. Because I, I firmly believe that if each of us did this, if each of us did this daily, if each of us found ways to love ourselves and love those around us in the ways that God intended us to do it, in the ways outlined in 1 Corinthians 13, our world would be a better place. Thanks so much.